right, folks, we got a lot of stuff to cover. No time for screwing around. Welcome to the live stream if you're viewing on Twitch. Welcome to the syndicated content if you're viewing elsewhere. We're going to talk about the sun in a minute. First, let's talk about the smash o forum. If you haven't been to smashomash.org yet, check it out, smashomash.org. Scroll down. And you will see, click here for the newly unveiled Smash O Forum. Set yourself up a login, get get conversations going about everything from cosmology, earth and geophysics, general science, the sun, and a free for all. So thanks everybody for signing up at the forum. If you haven't done so yet, link there at smashomash.org, or you could do smashomash.com slash forum. Let's move on to the sun. We're looking at 9 hours and 15 minutes here in 193 angstroms, and we see some missing data from some of the GOES instruments. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's first look at these diffuse coronal holes associated with that active region, formerly sunspot 2753, as well as the South Pole area. And uh, no sunspots, very weak solar activity. Here's the northern region. Again, this is 9 hours and 15 minutes. We did see a little bit of activity popping off, magnetically speaking. And again, we've got some missing data from some of the GOES spacecraft. Here's the southern view in 304 angstroms. You see the filaments in the west. Could make for a good thumbnail today. And here's the northern portion. And this is also nine hours worth of solar activity. And that's 304 angstroms. And let's look at some more data here. And there you can see the GOES X-ray flux stops right at midnight there, exactly at midnight. So we don't see any data from the GOES 15 or the GOES 16 in terms of X-rays. No indication that any X-rays popped off. 10.7 centimeter radio flux is still at 72. And we've seen an extended KP0 event here. Um, only uh, 15 of the past, 15 hours of the past three days or so have even been at a KP of one. So that's a legit human health alert there for cosmic ray flux. Things like heart arrhythmias, people, you know, heart patients, people that have mental instability, stuff like that. Um, and we have been seeing some, uh, some apparent oddities going on with human health stories since around Christmas. In any case, let's move on to look at more data here. Real-time solar wind. Phi angle is currently around 280 degrees. And we don't really see anything wild happening here at midnight. So it's interesting uh, why those satellites are down. We also see uh, missing electron flux data. We'll get to it in a minute. And we saw a recent uptick in the solar wind density here up to about 8. 8.6 protons per cubic centimeter there. It looks like the leading edge of a coronal hole wind stream, if you ask me. I uh, will be interested to see if this drops off over the next 12 hours and the solar wind speed goes up. We're under 300 kilometers a second for the solar wind speed, and we're seeing a weak magnetosphere. No surprise there with so much KP0. And there's the data from ACE. There's the GOES electron flux, and you can see the 14 is also not sending data. That's the red line here. So no idea what's going on with the electron flux since midnight. Goes 16 and goes 14 and goes 15, apparently not sending data. Here are, here's the latest uh, relativistic electrons, and that needs some updating. Let's look at the ionosphere to see continued anomalies in the South Pacific. They're around the 30 degree, the negative 30 degree mark there. Tropic of Capricorn area, right in here off the coast of South America. We see continued nighttime charge-ups of the ionosphere. And you'll see right there it charges up, but especially right here, sudden charge-up, charge-down events happening. There's another one, charge-up, charge-down events. So the Anomalies in the ionosphere continue over the South Pacific. This is over a month of this now. And the GOES magnetometer is also not sending data since midnight. 
So no data on the Gauss magnetometer, electron flux, or x-ray flux. So far all day today, December 30th. Let's look at the Gong 2 data. This data, one hour, 56 minutes old. <clears throat> Looking at the Earth from the perspective of the sun's pole, the top view ecliptic plane field plot. And we see right at the end, we see a little opening up of the field here, <clears throat> an indication there's probably a little bit of activity just setting from the Earth's perspective here. Let me bring the last frame up. You see that sudden opening, uh, probably an indication that there's some activity north of the solar equator, and it just snaps back shut right away. There's the next image. So you can see that little bit of green pointing through there. It did not change the overall polarity of the current sheet. Let's continue on to look at the magnetosphere movies, which are very weak. Very weak magnetohydrodynamic pressure, as well as some oddly shaped Van Allen belts out in the bow shock region there. Again, with a solar wind speed below 300 kilometers a second, that's legit solar minimum conditions, folks. We don't typically see a solar wind speed below 300 ever. So, But there's still a little more activity than when we were seeing radio flux of 64. And for that, we thank you. That's a good thing, as solar minima are things that cause civilizations to crumble due to things like crop failures. And by the way, I have insight into it, which I'll be sharing with our patrons later. Things like food prices. So if you're not a patron, consider becoming one. Here's the geospace ground magnetic perturbations, four hours worth of data, as we have at least three poles, two in the north and one in the south. Here's where stuff is in the solar system. It's very lonely on this side of the sun right now, as Earth is the only planet over here. And there's where things will be in one week. What are you doing for New Year's Eve, folks? Please leave a comment. And looking at in-the-sky.org, we see Mars just coming over the horizon. If you've got a low horizon, perhaps get an image of Mars on your telescope. Send it to us. We'll feature it on the channel. And the past 24 hours of earthquakes did not include anything over a 6 magnitude. And uh, not very many quakes, no real big quakes, no real deep events going on here. Let's scroll up the list. There's a deep quake in Alaska and a deep quake in Russia. That one's a 4.5 magnitude. And just scrolling up the list here, here's another deep quake in Western South America. And we've seen an onslaught of those over the past months. And here's a deep one at Russia. That one is at 388.2 kilometers south of the Kamchatka Peninsula. There's another deep quake at Chile, that one 4.3 magnitude at 112.6 kilometers. Here's one in between the African and Antarctic plates. That's a 5.3 magnitude. And I just want to check out this one on Hawaii, as we've been seeing shallow quakes. And when I say shallow, I mean thousands of meters above sea level. Here's another deep quake coming into Peru just about three hours before we made the video. It's currently 428 Eastern Standard Time. And that one is at a 2.5 kilometer depth. Okay, so that one's not... Let me just zoom in here as I see a second quake. Well, that one's at 28.5 kilometers out in the ocean, off the coast of Kilauea, and that one is at 2.5 kilometers depth, both small quakes. And we don't need to zoom in on that. And let's move on to more stuff.
All right, and let's look at the pressure maps on windy.com. Move this over a bit. There we go. And we'll press play, and we're going to let that advance about 24 hours. This is the GFS forecast, folks. Where we expect pressure zones to be in 24 hours. And thanks for leaving comments, everybody viewing on the Twitch stream. Shout out to Be Stoic and to Mary. Let's pause this about 24 hours. There we go. There's where we expect pressure systems to be around tomorrow at this time on New Year's Eve. Again, what are you doing for New Year's Eve? Leave a comment. Let's talk about coffee. Now, my understanding of where coffee was discovered, the, the fable I heard about it was that Juan Valdez was a goat farmer in, in Colombia, which is apparently not right because I guess coffee's not from Colombia. But uh, anyway, the story goes that he was out looking for his goats, and late in the afternoon he kept uh, noticing his goats were wandering off. So one day he found out where they were. They were up on a hill eating berries off of a small bush and acting very crazy, like the one you see in this GIF animation. Later, he decided to try the berries himself. He made a tea out of them, which we now know as coffee. Anyway, this myth, or tale, let's say, shout out to Terry, Terrence Leonard. Cheers. Thanks for sending us the link. Apparently, it actually can trace its heritage to the coffee forest on the Ethiopian plateau. Who knew? Anyway, the story is similar. If you want to read about it, we've left links in the description. And by the way, I'm drinking coffee out of a coffee maker now as I've, we've retired the French presses. Let's talk about more human health stories. A new organelle has been discovered, which appears and disappears as cell processes happen. So this is another interesting advance in perhaps anti-cancer science. There's this weird organelle that uh, only shows up apparently to organize certain things that happen during certain cellular activities. And uh, it's just like a droplet, but it's not really an oil. It's more like a gel that just appears and then goes away after it's done doing its job. So it's not hydrophobic like oil. It's more of a gel where cellular components can go in and out, but it remains, but it contains binding sites that concentrate a small set of the cell's contents. Data suggests the concentration of proteins is really important. I can get complex biomedical reactions to occur inside a droplet that I've been failing to reconstitute in a test tube for years. This is the secret sauce I've been missing. So let's hope it's a huge advance in cancer as Let's, let's make the human life expectancy 400 years and cure all diseases. If you're wondering why it's not infinite, even if all diseases were cured, folks, you would still die in approximately 400 years average because you could still be murdered or struck by lightning or eaten by a shark. So accidents would still kill people, but it would extend life to about 400 years. Volcano Rundown includes Kluchevskoy back on the list, producing a 20,000-foot ash plume way up north on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Mount Aso, possible activity there. Please don't pitch a tent on the lower slopes of Mount Aso. Mount Ibu exploding. Flight level 7,000 there. Krakatau still on the list. 8,000-foot ash plume there. Dakono, 7,000-foot ash plume. Fuego dissipated its ash. Sangay in Ecuador back on the list. Exploding, 19,000 foot flight level there. Revenador, exploding, 17,000 foot flight level there. Sabin Kaya, not sure, please don't pole vault it anyway, even though no identifiable volcanic ash appears in the satellite data. And please don't do the triple Lindy over Nevados de Chilean. Apparently there's still explosive activity happening there. And again, what are you doing for New Year's? It's only a day and 19 hours away, folks. The decade ends. Where will you be on New Year's Eve? We're considering building our own ball. If you enjoy the content, please press like and subscribe on YouTube. And keep in mind that YouTube pays us precisely zero for these videos. Thanks again for leaving comments on Twitch. If you're able to view us on Twitch, watch the videos live. 
if you want to see the information first. And there's going to be a lot of stuff going dark throughout the year 2020. There will be a lot of stuff that only our patrons will be able to see. Sorry, folks, but you got to pay to play. And there's the current lightning situation going on. Looks like the main lightning is in the eastern Mediterranean. And let's look at the uh, value-added services here. Here's a U.S. Doppler radar. And we see a very powerful low-pressure system here over western Iowa. Shout out to our Iowan viewers. And it looks like a hell of an ice storm in northern New York. Let's check out this low over Iowa. On the water vapor map. And there's the water vapor map. And let's just look at that convergence zone real quick over Iowa. We see some dry air swirling around in there, undoubtedly weakening the low pressure. As dry air has a tendency to want to rotate clockwise in the northern hemisphere. So major turbulence going to be going on in there. And there should be some, some interesting sudden winter storms and so on in those regions. As the central U.S. gets pummeled with snow. By the way, thanks patrons for being associate producers of the show. Let's look at some transients before we get into other cosmology stuff. What are your favorite transients? Please leave a comment. Let's first look at Sagittarius A star, the massive radio source at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Here are the recent transients from Sagittarius A star. And uh-oh, no data for the past two weeks. And I'm sure it's not because it's shut down, folks. It's just because no data is being sent. Let's check out Cygnus A, massive radio galaxy, otherwise known as 3C405. Yeah, 3C405, Massive Radio Galaxy. It's going to be on a shirt. And there's the data from the second strongest radio source in the entire sky. A radio galaxy 500 plus million light years distant. Anyway, there are the X-ray transients from that. Let's take a look at... How about the Gaminga Pulsar? There's a Gaminga Pulsar which we featured in one of our videos. Scroll down our thumbnails if you want to view it. We talked all about the Gaminga Pulsar about a week ago. There are the transients from Gaminga. And let's look at Crab, the most powerful X-ray source in the sky. And it really talks about Crab a lot because, hey, it's the strongest X-ray source in the sky. What can I say? And there are the transients from the Crab Nebula. Or I, I, I guess I should say the Crab Pulsar. Anyway, if you want to look at transients yourself, check out the Neil Gorel Swift Bat Observatory. That stands for Burst Alert Telescope, as these things are being monitored on the regs. And welcome to the vulgarity free. That is an ass. And that is a hole in the ground section where we like people to understand the distinction. Now, yesterday we talked about some fast things, such as S2, a star orbiting the massive radio source at the core of our Milky Way galaxy at 11 million miles per hour. Peregrine falcons are pretty quick, too. Apparently the fastest animal in the world. These things go into power dives in excess of 200 miles per hour. And they bean other birds on the back of the head, knocking them unconscious. And then they come back and pluck them right out of the air. Your neighbors are fast, so network them via nextdoor.com. When I checked out to see if there was a next door neighborhood where I am. There was none, so I started one. Uh, this is a great way to network your neighbors. You'd be able to trade stuff, um, you know, share contact information, uh, ask neighbors to watch your house when you go on vacation, all that sort of stuff. And uh, it's, it's a great way to report, you know, disasters, crime, all that sort of stuff. Nextdoor.com. I became a lead for our neighborhood. We've got uh, 
we have about 50% of the neighborhood now is on the network. So that's a good thing, nextdoor.com, network your neighborhood if you haven't already done so. It's free. They'll even send physical postcards to your neighbors. Let's talk about what happened in the past decade. Brick and mortar stores are going by the wayside. Now, this is nothing to fret about, folks. This is like when horse carriage manufacturers went out of business because of the invention of the automobile. This just represents another evolution in human shopping. So don't worry about it. Let's check out the list of retailers that went away. Toys R Us closed and is now under new ownership and has opened two experimental stores, one of which is in Jersey. And I won't be going because I try to stay out of Jersey at all costs. New Jersey, one of the worst states in the entire country. If you're from there, I apologize, but it's the government's fault, not yours. BB closed 180 stores. Blockbuster, 1,700-plus stores closed. Border closed 399 stores. Charlotte Rousset closed 510 stores. Dress Barn, 649 stores. Fred's, never heard of it, 568. Wet Seal, Jim Barry closed 749 stores. HR, HH Gregg, 220 stores. The Limited, 250 stores. Pay Less Shoes stores. Pay Less Shoe Source. Trying to learn how to speak the English language today, folks. Closed 2,589 stores. Sports Authority. Toys R Us, more than 800. Wet Seal, 500 stores there. How did you do your holiday shopping? I did a combination of brick and mortar, but typically... I don't shop in brick and mortar stores, except for things like groceries. Let's talk about the five trends that will go on to define the decade. Look into the future here, folks. 2020 is going to be a year of clear vision and uh, major changes coming through at places like smashamash.org, where we will indeed be selling the t-shirt, the 3C405 Cygnus A Massive Radio Galaxy t-shirt. It's happening. Anyway, check out these trends that are going to continue. Central banks are going to continue pouring money and credit into the financial system in an effort to keep the economy moving forward. This is why interest rates are so low and have been being lowered. It's to prop up things like the stock market as companies inflate the bubble by investing cheap money into their own capital stock, inflating the valuations to levels not seen since the tech crash in 1999 when I used to be a day trader. Also, the growing number of social ill, sick, and dysfunctional people. I can't comment on that one. Political shifts and polarization are rapidly increasing. Populism has been growing for several years when combined with surging inequality and discontent. People rise up and protest. And this is because centralization is dead, folks. Centralization is dead. Thanks to the internet for killing it. Centralized government is no longer necessary. Welcome to the neo-renaissance. As, as technology and artificial intelligence advance, those in power are moving forward, using these tools to turn us into pawns. Don't let big tech screw up your life, folks. They will raise your blood pressure. And Google, you are the leading waster of time on the planet with all of this junkware that barely works, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Gmail, which also spies on you and reads the body of your emails, by the way, folks, whether it's uh, Google Sheets. I mean, most of these software products barely function. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give a pass to Google Maps, as it's very useful with the traffic layer especially, helping us to avoid traffic. So I try to give credit where credit's due. Hey, Google, fix your junkware, or you're going to have the boot of society on your neck. Concern over climate change is on the rise. Sadly, few of those talking about it see cutting waste as a priority as all kinds of billions and billions of dollars, probably trillions, are wasted studying a thing that's not real, causing people to have straight-up harp attacks. As they don't understand atmospheric physics, guess what? The Earth's heat latency lies in the oceans, not in the atmosphere. This is why you can measure the atmosphere all day and not understand the Earth's temperature. Have you ever gone to the doctor and had the doctor take your temperature via a breathalyzer test? What's that? No. Oh, he has to use a thermometer? Right. The Earth's atmosphere only contains 0.1% of the Earth's heat latency. The rest of it is in the water. 
In other words, if you don't know the temperature of the Indian of the Indian Ocean nine meters down or even three meters down, which we don't, by the way, we know the surface temperature from satellite data, but we don't know the temperature three meters down, which means we don't even know the climate of the planet. Next. Let's talk about the Schumann resonances. Now, for those of you not aware, Schumann resonances are latent radio signals that bounce around in between the ionosphere and the surface of the planet. And check it out. We see some big spikes here. I'll leave links to this also below the video. And uh, a lot of people think this has to do with a lot of things that I don't believe. And we're going to cover it for a quick moment here. Again, links to this. This is the real-time data. Just keep in mind one thing. The Schumann resonances are expressed in hours of Tomsk summertime. So if you're trying to correlate this to other data and things like that, which I spent a solid two weeks doing uh, in late 2018, I believe it was. Now, let's talk about recent and upcoming Earth asteroid encounters. Just check out spaceweather.com, scroll down, and you'll see a nice list of the recent and upcoming objects. So let's check out this one here. It's going to be at 4.2 lunar, I'm sorry, it's going to be at 14.1 lunar distances. Actually, let's look at this one. It's going to be at 1.7 lunar distances. I'm not sure the exact timing of this. Let's see if I can get this to load. You're going to have to look this one up yourself, folks, as I may not be able to get this to play right. Let me see if I can get it to play. I don't know what it's doing, if it's playing or not. It says it's playing, but I don't see it playing anyway. If you want to track near-Earth objects, just check out spaceweather.com, and you'll see all of the all of the known recent and upcoming Earth asteroid encounters. Now let's talk about the conversation on the forum. Here's here's the here's the beef I have with Schumann resonances. Number one, the sun cancels out Schumann resonances during the daytime because the sun's radio emissions are strong and Schumann resonances are weak latent radio harmonics bouncing around in the atmosphere. I studied them for several weeks and saw zero correlating data with respect to ionosphere anomalies, geomagnetism, X-ray flux, electron flux, magnetometers, weather, earthquakes, cosmic ray flux, and lightning. Once you understand that every planet with an ionosphere has its own unique set of resonances based on ionosphere density, atmospheric density, and thickness, and molecular makeup, Perhaps he won't believe an asteroid has anything to do with Schumann resonances. Now, I'm not saying that they don't, as B. Stoic has brought up some interesting points here in a scientific paper. So, again, perhaps check out the smashomash.com slash forum if you want to read about it. Now, this interesting paper that he brought up talks about a comet affecting Mars's electron flux. Uh, an indication, perhaps, that it's pulling electrons out of Mars's Van Allen belts. Um, so it is interesting. Keep in mind this was a comet, not a, just a regular asteroid, and it was only 0.3 lunar distances from Mars when it occurred. Again, more reasons to check out smashomash.com slash forum. And here's another site that monitors the Schumann resonances. Again, keep in mind that these are in Tomsk time, which is seven hours ahead of Greenwich Mean Time, otherwise known as Universal Time. It's plus 7 UT. Here's an image of the Schumann resonances, and these are just like guitar string harmonics. As they interfere with each other, sometimes they amplify each other depending on which wavelengths are popping up. There are certain ones that are more common than others. The fundamental mode is 7.83 hertz. And I don't want to get into a long description of the Schumann resonances because I'm not convinced that they are correlated with anything. They're just an after effect of all of the incoming, let's just say, solar inputs. I've left links to this article here also. It is not free to read as far as I can tell. Uh, but it was just published. So this comet approach happened way back in 2014 on October 19th. And to put it in simple terms, 
the Martian ionosphere suffered a quick and complex variability with large density increases and decreases every few kilometers. The variability was caused by the presence of the comet, and we discussed different processes that could have occurred. So for 10 hours, the Martian ionosphere was in touch with the cometary coma. And this is pretty serious stuff, folks. Um, this is an indication that if a comet got close to Earth, it could massively disrupt the ionosphere and cause all kinds of unexpected things to happen with Earth's magnetohydrodynamics. Hey, thanks again, patrons. Please consider becoming one if you're not already, as that is the source of funding for this channel, not YouTube. YouTube pays us zero. Anyway, if you like the content, please <laughs> press like and subscribe on YouTube. Press that notification bell. Maybe you'll even see when our videos go up. And thanks again, Twitch viewers. Please consider viewing the videos on Twitch if you'd like to see them live. And we will continue changing around the content here and there, putting up new types of videos. Thanks, Smash Team. That's everybody who tuned in. Please leave a comment. And uh, thanks, new viewers. And to our latest patron, let's talk about Betelgeist or Betelgeuse, or however you want to pronounce it. Now, this is the first Hubble image of a star, which happened to be of Betelgeuse. Why? Because it's one of the, one of the brightest objects, and uh, it's super obvious. It's uh, Orion's belt kind of points at it perpendicularly. Here's another image of Betelgeuse. And why are we talking about Betelgeuse? Because Betelgeuse suddenly got fainter than it has been in over a century. So it's uh, some interesting behavior by the red supergiant, which is so large, it would be approximately the size of Jupiter's orbit if it were in our solar system located where the sun is. So if you want to read more about Betelgeuse, I've left a link to the freestarcharts.com article about it. And here it is in radio. I just wanted to note how odd the shape of it is. Now, they've drawn in the optical disc there. If you looked at this in optical, it would just look round, like a sphere. But when you look at it in radio, it's completely teardrop-shaped. I thought that was an interesting factor. They also did put the scale for Jupiter's orbit on there. And, uh, yeah. Now, Betelgeuse appears to be about 600 light-years away, six to 700 light-years away. And I looked and looked to find it on a, on a galaxy star chart, and I just couldn't find it. But I did leave links to the National Geographic article about how a giant star is acting strange, and everybody's buzzing as mainstream astronomy thinks that this thing is going to go supernova. Now, if it does nova, it'll be very interesting, and it will cause effects on Earth. Now, it won't cause direct physical effects on Earth, but because it is so big and close enough that it would be visible during the daytime sky with a magnitude similar to the moon. So uh, let's just say some people would freak out if, if Betelgeuse supernova or nova I'll say. Um, and these things are known to suddenly go into a lower activity state right before they go into a very high activity state. And this is part of the fear of solar minimum, folks. In any case, we've left links to the article here on Nat Geo. And you'll see it all over the Science Wire if you search for Betelgeist today, or the past week, actually. Um, it's been dimming and dimming, so we're going to keep watching it and see how dim it gets. And it'll be interesting to see what the red supergiant does next. This talks all about where the name came from. It was mistranslated, yada, yada, yada. Read the article. And welcome to the bonus feature. Actually, another bonus feature. It's the local yellow dwarf in 171 angstroms. And just have some patience. Let it load. And there you go. My personal favorite view of the local yellow dwarf, the 171 angstroms view. And that's 48 hours, folks, from the SDO. And we see a little bit of activity setting there. That's former sunspot 2754 up here in the northwest. Active region there south of the equator. It's former sunspot 2753. 
Anyway, thanks for tuning in, all of you who did. Thanks, especially patrons. Remember, stare at the sun, don't drink, and if you drink, don't drive. And since it'll never be now again, may that solar wind be at your back and that atherosclerosis absent from your veins.